Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, th thank you for having me here. Um, so this is the first time I've given this talk. So if anything's confusing, please ask lots of questions. Uh, do be clear, I am a theorist. I am talking about theoretical proposals. I will try to make connections to experiment, but this is definitely pushing the bounds uh, sort of theoretically and hopefully experimentalists will figure out how to do this stuff eventually. Um, so what I, uh, and let's see, before I, you know, the, this stuff was funded. Uh, the initial projects were funded by my NSF career grant, and then we applied the techniques to uh, some other physics with my DOE grant. Uh, and this was all done with my postdoc, uh, Victor Quito, uh, and I've stolen some slides from here, so I really have to thank him. Um, so that said, let's get started. So I am a condensed matter theorist. I'm interested in what we call correlated electronic materials, and I also like to cook a lot. Uh, and so this is my favorite analogy for why correlated electrons are interesting and why you would study them. So here's the picture. Ions are garlic, uh, electrons are like olive oil. When you add them together, uh, you can do things, you can do lots of things, uh, but you can do some things that end up looking like the original ingredients. So they look kind of like garlic, fried garlic chips. Uh, this, in my analogy, is you add electrons and ions together and they look like things, they look like electrons and ions. Um, and so this is most weakly correlated materials, metals, semiconductors, even superconductors and uh, magnetic orders are essentially, they all more or less look like electrons. Um, but you can also do uh, weirder stuff and you get something that looks totally different. So this is, oh, what happens? goodness. Um, Try that again. Uh, hold on a second. Nope. There we go. Okay. So, uh, okay. So you can get this, which is aioli. You take garlic and olive oil and you blend them up really fast. And if you're sufficiently skilled, you get something that basically like garlic mayonnaise, but there's no eggs or stabilizers added. But anyway, the point for the analogy is it looks absolutely nothing like garlic or olive oil. Uh, it's something totally different. And that's, okay. This has not been a problem before. Um, Sorry, I have to try to mirror display so it looks okay in the zoom and then swap them. Nope, there it goes. All right, we'll see if it breaks at the same place. Um, so, okay. So we get uh, correlated materials have things that don't look like electrons or ions. So they have what we call fractional excitation. So this, uh, all right. I have no idea. Um, sorry. There's a lot of animations <laughs> and I haven't had, it wasn't, it was running earlier today, no problem. Let me try not, um, let me give the zoom the worst thing. Let's see if this works. Okay, and let's get off of this slide. Uh, nope, that's even worse. All right. Oh, possibly. Okay. If that's the issue, we'll try. All right, so the main idea is the ingredients are known, uh, but you can get unexpected results. So the problem with this is that these interesting correlated bases can be really hard to find. 
Um, so there's two things I'm interested in, and this talk is mostly about how to get to them instead of what they are. So I'm going to give you the really quick uh, overview of two different phases. So spin liquids is something owner also works a lot on. There are unusual quantum ground states that you find in insulating magnetic materials. So they don't have any magnetic long range order, and instead they actually form something called topological order. And they exhibit these fractional low energy excitations. So you see half of an electron, if you take an electron and you take the charge and you stick it to the lattice and you let the spin move around by itself, that's sort of what's going on uh, in these materials at low temperatures and they have long range quantum entanglement. And so here's an example of sort of how they're difficult to find. This is the triangular lattice where we have a nearest neighbor coupling uh, J1 and you can add next nearest neighbor couplings and have a Heisenberg interaction uh, Hamiltonian that looks like this. Uh, and then you can also add something called a chiral field, uh, which promotes the scalar spin chirality. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. But here is what the phase diagram of this model looks like from exact diagonalization. So this is the typical ordered phase, which looks like this 120 degree order. These phases here are also magnetically ordered phases that look a little bit different. Uh, but these two phases here are spin liquids, which are what we're interested in finding. Um, and so this particular phase is a, a Z2 spin liquid, uh, and it exists in a pretty narrow range of J2 over, this is all scaled by J1. The chiral spin liquid seems easier to find, except we don't actually know how to turn on J chi in nature in equilibrium physics. Uh, in non-equilibrium, we can actually do that. And that's part of what I'm going to talk about. Um, but real materials often sit here, and it's hard to move them around. So we don't know any triangular lattice materials that end up sitting in this, this part of the phase diagram. And we would really like to study this kind of physics. Um, so that's sort of one problem. The other problem I'm interested in is condo physics. So to give you a 30-second introduction to that, this is a case where we have uh, two types of electrons. One are localized on uh, site and form local magnetic moments. One are basically non-interacting, those from free conduction electrons, but these can spin flip scatter off of one another. They have an antiparamagnetic interaction. And at low temperatures, they form what's called a condo singlet where the conduction electrons essentially screen out the local moments and what you get is a total spin of your system is zero. So it no longer responds like a free uh, magnet. What I'm interested in is a much weirder version uh, called multi-channel condo physics. So here is an example of two-channel condo physics where my conduction electrons uh, can have sort of two flavors. So here are their different colors uh, and they can screen, they can both screen the local moments. And so they both try and they're too good at it. Um, so, they do what's called overscreening. So essentially, you know, the orange electrons come along and try to screen it. Uh, and we're sorry, both orange and green come along and try to screen it at the same time. And then you're left with a net moment in the opposite direction. You try to get more screening and uh, things get uh, very weird. And you get actually qu a quantum critical uh, point that has a one half R log two zero point entropy. You can describe it with a Myron fermion. It's very strange. But this is only when the two channels have the exact same antiferromagnetic interaction with your local moment. So here is sort of the cartoon of the impurity phase diagram. So I can tune the relative ratio of the condo couplings. When they're exactly equal, I have a quantum criticality, which you can detect at finite temperatures with a fan. When you go one way or another, either the orange electrons screen the local moment or the green ones do. But real materials, are generally have very, very small uh, amounts of a second channel, right? They're generally just one. Um, and so uh, all of the interesting physics you might get as you tune through that quantum critical point is very hard to access. All right, so that's the motivation. This is what we wanna find. And so I'm gonna talk about how you use uh, driving materials with periodic light in order to access this. So, this is uh, Floquet's theorem is what I'm going to tell you about, but I'm going to first remind you of Bloch's theorem because it works exactly the same way. They're actually the Bloch Floquet theorem. We just tend to use Bloch's theorem when we're talking about periodic potentials in space and Floquet's uh, theorem when you're talking about periodic potentials in time. So imagine I have a bunch of, of uh, 
ions in a lattice. They're spaced by some A, and I have some overlap between neighboring ions that I can call T1. And so that allows electrons to hop from one side to the other. I can have further neighbor hoppings T2. Those are generally much smaller. And so if I have no hoppings, I have maybe say N atomic levels. And when I turn on the hoppings, they broaden into N different dispersive bands. And the bands will have a width given by this sort of original hopping. Um, and the eigenstates of these bands are block wave functions. So they can be written as a plane wave term times some function that's actually periodic with a potential. So the plane wave isn't necessarily periodic, but this U is exactly periodic. And that's, you can prove that anything that solves your Schrodinger equation is gonna look like this. Um, no matter what weird periodic potential you have, as long as it's periodic. And so you can write this because this U is uh, periodic with facing A, you can write it in this form. Uh, and so I've done this explicitly because now I'm gonna go talk about how we do Floquet engineering, which is when we look at periodicity and time. So we take a Hamiltonian that has some period in time, capital T, and in equilibrium, it has, I'll say if I'm thinking about impurity, I have some set of levels that I'm gonna label EA. They can also be labeled with momentum, so they can be a full lattice in two dimensions. Uh, but this is my equilibrium picture. And I'm going to turn on my time periodic potential and I'm gonna do it very, very weakly. So right now, the first thing it does is that I can write all of my states here uh, in the form of those block wave functions, except here uh, I have time where I had position and I have this energy EA where I had uh, momentum before. So energy uh, and time are related essentially like position, uh, mo momentum and position. And I can write my states in this particular form where these are sort of the Fourier coefficients of that periodic potential or periodic wave function. Um, and this frequency omega is uh, two pi over the period. And so when you solve the time independent Schrodinger equation, you Fourier transform this, you get this thing for just these sort of coefficients here. Um, and so if you uh, just forget about coupling between different sectors, so just take m is equal to n, then you're just solving the Schrodinger equation within each of these things that I call flow k sectors. So the this is what we had in equilibrium. And we just make copies of that. And those copies are staggered by uh, h bar m omega. Uh, and so this is not doing anything in particular. It's just make many copies. But now I can also consider the terms that might mix these Floquet sectors. So if I have terms that essentially will hop electrons between different Floquet sectors. So these terms are analogous to the T1 or T2 or T3 terms that I showed for a block theorem. Um, and typically what I'm gonna talk about uh, is coupling systems to relatively weak harmonic electromagnetic fields that we can treat essentially perturbatively uh, so that these Floquet sectors are mixing uh, perturbatively and we can then calculate the new effective equilibrium Hamiltonian using perturbation theory on these problems, yes. Nope, they're just two independent directions. Yeah. And everything I've written here uh, is totally generic. Uh, if your perturbation, if your coupling between sectors is not weak, then obviously you can't use perturbation theory. But that's sort of the basic picture. Um, okay. So what does this actually look like if I were to do an experiment? So this is a non-equilibrium technique because it's very hard to just drive things with an electromagnetic field at a high frequency forever, uh, especially with the uh, frequencies and intensities that we're interested in. So instead you're gonna do ultra fast pulses. Um, and so this is the pulse sort of shape that you're applying. And uh, this direction is time and this is sort of roughly measuring the distance from equilibrium of your system. So you start the pulse, it drives your system out of equilibrium with some uh, very transient behavior. Then you have a region here, and this is the one that we're interested in, um, where we can do 
where we can really think of our Hamiltonian as essentially being periodic with the periodicity of this laser pulse. After you turn off the pulse, then things will start to decay and they'll thermalize. Um, and then you have all sorts of other interesting physics, but it's not Floquet physics. So Floquet physics is actually kind of easier to understand than the stuff that goes on uh, afterwards when you end up equilibrating to maybe a different temperature, but you've also mixed everything up. So let's go through sort of uh, a cartoon picture. So in this sort of transient regime where we have the Floquet physics, let's say I have a band structure that looks like this. So it's a band structure you get for graphene, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. And this is just my equilibrium copy. So when I turn on my periodic potential, I'm going to make, you know, an infinite number of copies of these spaced by the frequency uh, or the energy h bar omega. And then the couplings um, between the flow case sectors means that these bands will actually mix and gap out, which I didn't uh, make a nice picture for here, um, but you'll see on one of the next slides. And so. This uh, was done, uh, this is a very hard experiment. There's only a few cases that have been done. So this is looking at bismuth to selenium three. It's a topological insulator, which has surface states that look a little bit like this. Uh, and so what you see here are at least three, four copies. Uh, so here is maybe the original one and there's four copies of this that you see. Uh, and so this is a measurement with uh, angle result photo emission um, after in this sort of locate regime. And if you subtract off the uh, equilibrium result before you apply the pulse, you can see uh, actually that these bands have gapped out. Um, okay, and so this is just sort of showing that you can actually see some of this locate physics. So, what we want to do is use flo the Floquet engineering to actually drive new phases. Uh, and new physics that we didn't see in equilibrium. Um, and so here I want to talk about graphene uh, and Floquet engineering with graphene to induce a topological phase. So graphene is a honeycomb lattice uh, where you have electrons hopping with nearest neighbor interactions. And it's a two-dimensional uh, zero gap semiconductor with this kind of dispersion. And we zoom in and see these uh, Dirac points where the bands are touching. And what so uh, when we're looking for topological phases, looking for uh, we look for surface states. So right now this is not gap, so it has no topological phases. Um, but we can do what's called a slab calculation, where we basically put an edge in here and then do the full calculation of what your band structure should look like. So you get a bunch of bulk bands, and you also get a surface band. This is a cartoon. Um, and so now we're going to look at what happens when we gap out the Dirac nodes using Floquet engineering. So there is a original proposal for doing this. Uh, it's back in 1987, uh, Duncan and Haldane proposed something called the Haldane model, which uh, realizes essentially a quantum Hall effect without external magnetic field. Um, and so this you can get by theoretically very easily. You can solve this problem in Mathematica like really easily, I assign it as homework. Uh, in my condensed matter class. Uh, so you just add a complex next nearest neighbor hopping. Um, so that's what this picture is supposed to denote. You have a hopping between uh, B and B sites and A and A sites, and it has a direction because it's complex. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really know how to do that very easily in real materials. Um, oh, sorry, before I say that, uh, this is uh, essentially a quantum Hall state. And so you have chiral edge modes uh, on your top and bottom and side edges as well. That is what this picture is denoting. So we don't know how to do this necessarily in real materials, but if I apply circularly polarized light uh, and I allow essentially my bouquet hopping between, it's essentially photon assisted hopping uh, between these sites, it gives me an effective complex next nearest neighbor hopping. And so, that can then gap out these bands and give you these chiral edge modes. So this is a theoretical calculation from this uh, paper, which is not my paper, um, but you have essentially uh, a cop, here's your, your sort of n equals zero case, up here there's another cone and down here there's another cone. So you, there, you see they're intersecting and starting to gap out. 
And this number up here is the fluence, which is the strength of the electromagnetic field or the laser that you're using to drive it. So as you increase this, you sort of increase these gaps. Um, and so this is the fluence they used experimentally. And what they did was uh, they ended up measuring the Hall conductivity using a photo switch. And this gives you a sort of a quantized value when you have a chiral edge mode. And so when you're in this gapped region, uh, you have realized this topological Haldane phase. Uh, and you have this basically quantized Hall conductivity that tells you you're in this space. Uh, pretty much exactly where you expect. So you Floke engineered this Haldane model that you could not get otherwise. All right. So what I'm interested in doing is applying this to correlated materials. And this is a much harder experimental problem. Um, theoretically, it's not uh, too much harder, actually. But uh, what we're interested in is taking materials that are governed by magnetic exchange interactions, like the triangular lattice model I showed. And we want to look for these weird spin liquid phases. Um, one thing we're particularly interested in, in are chiral spin liquids. The, these break time reversal uh, symmetry, but they don't have any actual magnetic ordering, and they do have topological order. Uh, and they order essentially this scalar spin chirality, which is essentially a solid angle between three spins around a triangle. So that's sort of a picture of that. Um, they said they often require chiral fields, which are just something that couples exactly to the thing you want to order. Uh, so it's easy to write down theoretically, but this is, does not occur in nature. You can't uh, just apply like a magnet, it, like a magnetic field, but you can induce it in Floquet engineering by circularly polarized light. Um, and so this is a not been done experimentally, but there's a really nice theoretical paper by Tom Devereaux's group that did a heavy duty numerical simulations. So they took this uh, magnetic lattice, which is called the Kagame lattice. So this has a nearest neighbor exchange coupling here. And then they added uh, circularly polarized light with a certain frequency, and this induced a chiral interaction. And here is sort of their results. So on the x-axis is the strength of the laser field that they're applying. On the y-axis is the frequency. Uh, and then the color scale is the strength of the chiral coupling compared to the um, J here. And so you see for some regions of parameter space, you can get this to be pretty large around 0.4. And that can drive you from the ground state of this material, which is actually a quantum spin liquid into this chiral spin liquid. So you can really, theoretically at least, use this to tune from one type of spin liquid to another uh, by a kind of field that you can't uh, otherwise find in equilibrium physics. So what about sort of inducing spin liquids? How much can we actually enhance for their neighbor interactions if we wanted to look at the triangular lattice uh, without the chiral spin liquid, for example? Um, so this J2 over J1 uh, that we find in equilibrium is usually too small, uh, as is another type of coupling called ring exchange. The chiral fields require driving. And this is sort of the big question is, can we actually start in an ordered state and drive the material into a spin liquid? So these are some of the phase diagrams for the triangular lattice, where you can go from sort of an ordered state into a couple of kinds of spin liquids. So that was what we we're interested in studying is, is can you actually do this? So. Uh, now I'm gonna go into how you actually do these kind of calculations. So instead of looking at just non-interacting electrons and making many copies of different Floquet sectors and coupling them, we're gonna start with interacting electrons. So this is the Hubbard model where I have uh, electrons hopping on a lattice. Here we'll take the triangular lattice. And I also have this strong uh, Hubbard on-site interaction. And that tells me that if I'm at half filling, which I'm gonna insist upon, that I only want to have one electron on each site. So this U is going to be very, very large. Um, and so that means that there's no double occupancy. If I don't have any double occupancy, I'm a half filled. I can only, I can't have any empty sites as well. So I have local moments, there they are, uh, on each site. Uh, and for infinite U, they don't interact at all. I have a very large degeneracy of two to the N, if N is my number of sites. 
Um, but then I can do degenerate perturbation theory and I can find my magnetic exchange interactions. And so this is the idea called super exchange. The basic idea is if I have an electron sitting on this site, it can hop over here and temporarily be doubly occupied, and then it can hop back. Uh, but it can only do that if the electrons are anti-parallel on the two sites. Um, and so that gives a anti-paramagnetic interaction. Um, and so you can do this. So this is the first order term uh, where you get something that's order T squared because it hops there and it hops back and it costs its energy U in the meantime. And then you get higher order uh, corrections. You can also calculate further neighbor exchange. Um, so second neighbor is like between these two guys. This is only in fourth order in perturbation theory uh, and so on for uh, third neighbor, which is between these two and ring exchange, which is when the electron essentially hops around a ring um, here. And so this is an expansion that's valid as long as T is relatively small. So this is all equilibrium physics. This is how we start from the Hubbard model and go to uh, the Heisenberg model, which I was showing you before. And so now we're going to start applying light. So I have a triangular lattice here. I am going to shine light straight down on it with some uh, frequency omega. And I'm going to couple this to the electrons via the usual pyrrole substitution. So when you're writing it in a discrete lattice like this, your pyrrole substitution basically looks like this. So if you have a hopping from say I to J, uh, and so here there's three different directions your hopping can be along in the triangular lattice. Uh, you get uh, your Tij is modified by e to the negative iea uh, dotted into the vector between your two lattice sites. So you can write this as some coefficient out front, the, which is just the usual coefficient. You have some dimensional fluence, average fluence along this direction, and then you have some phase uh, difference between a and l. Um, and note, because our uh, light is coming straight down, our electric field is going to be in the plane. Okay, so we've taken our single site Hubbard model and we've coupled it to our, peri our periodic electric field. Um, so this is an expression of the periodicity essentially. And now we can look at what uh, our system looks like. So here, unfortunately, my picture is in terms of honeycomb layers, but Essentially, I have each flow K sector is I can think of as a copy of my lattice, right? So I have one copy that's that M equals zero flow K sector. I have one copy that's the M equals one flow K sector. I have U's uh, on each sector, but they get bumped up by omega uh, or M omega, generally speaking, as I go to higher and higher sectors. So let me explain this Hamiltonian. Um, so we have hopping that is from site to site, but also between different flow K sectors. So we sort of separated out the notation here. So I annihilate sector N and I create sector M while I'm annihilating an electron on site I plus delta I and then creating one on site I. Um, so this hopping term is really taking me between the different flow K sectors generally, although it can also be within the sectors. Whereas this interaction term U has this additional H bar omega um, times this cost of the double occupancy, uh, but it's diagonal in the sectors. So it isn't doing anything particularly interesting. This T is something that I can calculate straightforwardly by integrating this expression. And it generally gives me a Bessel function uh, of the uh, amplitude along that particular link with a phase uh, that can depends on what kind of electric field uh, you're applying. Um, all right, so this is uh, then a fairly straightforward uh, model. You can use a canonical transformation or perturbation theory. Uh, it's not, yeah, it's actually a canonical transformation uh, in U plus M omega with these hoppings being essentially perturbative uh, hoppings between sectors and the like. And so you get a very similar expression, which is essentially just this T squared over U plus M omega. So, but there are now many terms with many different denominators. Um, but otherwise it looks very similar to the uh, result we had for the equilibrium super exchange. 
And so this is now my uh, J1 that my spins are actually going to experience uh, in this floquet time period. So, okay. And yeah, so this is valid as long as T is much smaller than U plus M omega, you have to sort of avoid where U is equal to uh, an integer times omega, because that's going to give you a resonant behavior. And that's uh, going to cause heating very quickly to infinite temperatures. So that's, in fact, what I'm going to show here. So this is um, here a very simple model of the Hubbard uh, band structure. So we have uh, lower and upper Hubbard bands that are separated by the interaction energy U, and they're broadened by the hopping T with some numerical factors that depend on the lattice that you're doing. And so if you're off resonance and you have some uh, M omega is less than, uh, it's not exciting anything from this lower band, which is generally occupied to this upper band, which is empty, then you're okay. You're not going to heat things up. But if you start to, uh, oops, next thing, uh, yeah, if, so if you start to have M omega that's going from one band to the other, then you can do these excitations, right? So your laser is just going to start exciting real excitations of electrons from the lower Hubbard band to the upper Hubbard band. Uh, and those will quickly heat you up to infinite temperatures. So you need to be really careful to avoid these kinds of resonances. Um, and so this here is the frequency line uh, I tell you where sort of the resonances are because they're U divided by any integer. So there's lots down here. Uh, they get more and more spaced out and then there's no more once you get past this uh, omega. Um, so, right. Uh, and they will generally be broadened by hopping. So you're even more restricted. Okay. That's sort of the idea is you want to avoid these resonances um, and you end up with these restrictions on your frequencies in order to be able to actually do this kind of uh, uh, engineering without heating your sample immediately to infinity. Of course, it will eventually heat up to infinity if your pulse is on for a really long time, but that's generally not possible right now. So we don't worry too much about that. All right, so in this picture, there's two tuning parameters. There's the light frequency omega, which gives these resonances, uh, and then there's the overall strength. And they both sort of occurred. Let me just go back. Uh, they both occur in this uh, coupling here. So this comes into the numerator with the strength of the uh, electromagnetic field, and then the denominator uh, gets tuned by this frequency here. So. All right, um, and so what the main thing we did was look at how you can use polarization as an additional tuning tool. So in general, you can write the electric field uh, as a frequency dependent part and then a polarization vector where your polarization vector is perpendicular to the uh, direction of propagation. So for us, it's gonna be sitting in the X, Y plane. Uh, and Polarization can take basically, so this is sort of how we sketch the uh, polarization. We can use the Poincaré sphere. So you can have horizontally polarized light, say along X, back here is uh, vertically polarized light along Y. You also have plus 45 and minus 45. And then you can have complex linear combinations of X and Y, so X plus I, Y and X minus IY give you uh, left circularly polarized light and right circularly polarized light. And for the same amplitude of your light, uh, you can essentially vary the polarization over this sphere, which is called the Poincaré sphere. So this is parameterized by something called Stokes parameters, and you can write them in terms of two different angles, which give you your location on this sphere. Um, and the main point about polarization is the polarization is always going to break some kind of symmetry uh, unless you are very careful in how you align it with your sample. So if I have a uh, circularly polarized light, this is like X plus I, Y. It has a particular direction that the polarization is rotating. So this breaks time reversal symmetry. It breaks chirality, which breaks mirror planes or inversion symmetries. Uh, so if you wanted, if you want to break them and drive a chiral field, that's really great. If you don't, 
then that's bad. Uh, and you don't want to use circularly polarized light. But if you use linearly polarized light, this is going to pick out a particular direction in your lattice. And so unless you very, very carefully align your laser uh, to be along some high symmetry direction, um, you're going to break or yeah, you're going to end up breaking your lattice rotation symmetry. So that's also bad. Um, so there are some good things that you can do, right? So with circularly polarized light, it's said you can induce this kind of complex hopping in chiral fields that are very useful for generating chiral spin liquids. With linearly polarized light, you can tune your magnetic anisotropies, right? So you can uh, increase your J's along some directions and decrease them along others. You can even tune your dimensionality to go from something two-dimensional to one-dimensional, for example. You could even use this in theory to restore symmetries if you have something like this anisotropic triangular lattice where you have one direction is different. You put your light polarization parallel to that and you can tune a particular fluence that's going to tune these hoppings to be the same. And so then you'll essentially restore this uh, threefold symmetry. So there's lots of possibilities using polarization, but we don't always want that. Sometimes we want to be able to tune without breaking symmetries, particularly if you're interested in, say, spin liquids, which uh, non chiral spin liquids, which generally don't break any symmetries. And so for that, you need unpolarized light. And so we can describe unpolarized light uh, in general by paths on the Poincare sphere, such that when you average over them, your average of this sort of vector of Stokes parameters is zero. So there's two really straightforward kinds. So type one is you average over the entire Poincare sphere. Uh, that's what you get. This kind of light right now is thermally generated light. That's generally type one light. Uh, you can also average just over all linear polarizations. So this is something called type two Glauber light. Uh, and what we found really interesting is that these give you actually quite different results. So they're really different. They're generated differently and they can give you different physical consequences. So the type two Glauber rate is actually the easiest to generate. You take two uh, slightly detuned laser frequencies. Uh, and one is left circularly polarized and one is right circularly polarized. And if you do that, then you see that your electric field uh, is going to trace out this uh, Lisa Zhu figure. And if so, where the polarization is sort of slowly rotating within the plane. And so this is how you can sort of describe uh, unpolarized light is if you let this. Uh, this 2 to detuning actually get pretty small, then it's rotating pretty quickly. And so as long as your electrons are not, uh, are, are gonna be able to feel the averaged uh, effect of this polarization, then you really have unpolarized light. And this is something you can generate with two lasers with just slightly different frequencies. So here is this, the actual electric field uh, associated with this. So you see it has a polarization vector that we're allowing to rotate with a frequency omega p, and we're going to take that frequency to be a fraction of the original frequency, uh, the frequency of the actual laser itself, um, and we'll have it divided by some integer n, so that it will trace out a figure that looks like this and comes back to itself. Uh, and then it has a periodicity. We can still use all of the machinery from the Floquet engineering. So writing this out in terms of the two circularly polarized light waves, it looks like this. Uh, and uh, the problem is there are there is a periodicity, but what it gives me is a periodicity that has a much uh, uh, smaller frequency. And so what we end up with are many closely spaced bouquet sectors. So this is the picture, if I don't have any polar, any rotation of my polarization vector, I have a spacing between my flow K sectors of omega, which is big in this case. And then I allow my polarization vector to rotate. This introduces an additional time scale. And so I need to add many more flow K sectors where the spacing between them is this H bar omega P. Uh, so this is what it looks like if I have just N equals five. Uh, and so this, seems kind of prob oh sorry no, there's supposed to be uh this seems kind of problematic i thought i had one more okay um so my hopping is going to be between the these things but this seems very problematic uh cuz i'm going to it's going to be hard to avoid resonances right uh and 
you wonder, do I actually recover the unpolarized behavior? Because this is really a different problem, right? This is the polarization vector is rotating, but you might wonder if you actually get it back. So that's what we looked into. Um, and so, okay. So what we have are hopping between these flow case sectors associated with this much smaller frequency. And we can calculate these using the same uh, formula as before. And so these are the red uh, lines. Red lines here are giving me the weights of the different hopping. So this is the magnitude of the hopping squared. And I'm plotting this as a function of m over n. So these blue peaks are essentially giving me these hopping, these uh, flow k sectors here. Um, and so what you see, this calculation is actually for n equals 25. But you see that the weights of these resonances are actually really closely clustered around this uh, much larger frequency differences. And they go essentially to zero uh, in between. And so that means those resonances are effectively neutralized. Um, and so the weights of these hoppings between floquet sectors are going to essentially vanish. So they will cancel out of our perturbative calc or our calculation of our J's. So our J's will not blow up um, and we won't end up having heating issues. Um, moreover, we can also sort of effectively replace these guys with one uh, averaged sort of T that's like a hopping between these guys uh, and use this to calculate the magnetic exchange coupling. So this is the real calculation uh, written in kind of a funny way, um, but it's essentially the same thing as I had before. There's T squared U plus uh, M omega P. Uh, but if you group it this way and you have sufficiently large Ns, you can rewrite it as an effective hopping uh, divided by U plus uh, M tilde omega, where, M, where this is the real omega, not omega P. Okay, so, and practically speaking, what that ends up looking like is actually just an average over the polarization. Um, so what we did was we did the full calculation of the exchange couplings using different numbers of uh, Ns. So having a different ratios of omega P to omega. And so we calculated two things, first the J1. Uh, and so this is, the result for n equals three, n equals five, n equals 10, and this is n equals 25, and it doesn't change really anymore after that. So you see it quickly sort of approaches by n equals 10, it's very, very close to the very large n result. Um, what you also see is, you know, your polarization is rotating in this plane. So in principle, you get different j's along different directions um, for different n's, but uh, that difference also vanishes as we go to large enough n. And then down here, we also calculated this chiral field that you get, uh, because if n is equal to one, you just have circularly polarized light. Uh, and so you get a chiral field, sorry, the x, the y axis, the x axis is the strength of the electromagnetic field in dimensionless units. And then this is just the coupling strength uh, also in dimensionless units. So you get a fairly large chiral field. Uh, for n equals one. And then as we increase n, here's n equals three, here's n equals five, here's n equals 10, and then uh, n equals 25 is just flat along that bottom axis. So uh, we have uh, essentially by n equals 10, we've reproduced the expected unpolarized behavior. Um, so you have isotropic uh, couplings and you have vanishing chiral fields. And this is sort of a schematic picture as you change n, for n equals one, you have circularly polarized light. For n equals infinity, you're sort of stuck uh, and so you actually have linearly polarized light. But as you're approaching this, you enter this region where you really have the behavior of unpolarized light. So you get zero net chirality, you preserve your lattice symmetry. So using this, we can then calculate uh, actual things for the triangular lattice. So this is essentially calculating the change in the nearest neighbor coupling, next nearest neighbor coupling to the nearest neighbor, um, the third neighbor, the ring exchange, and the chiral coupling. So this black is the chiral coupling. As you crank up the strength of the, the field, it gets up reasonably large. Uh, the ring exchange actually gets fairly large. That's the green here. 
blue is the next nearest neighbor. So this is for a particular frequency that's sort of optimally chosen um, to be between the resonances and avoid that heating issue. So you notice the absolute numbers here are very small. Um, so the change in the ratio of J2 over J1 can get up to around 0 0.03, 0 .0, maybe 0 0.04 or 5, if you allow A0 to get a little bit bigger. Um, but the absolute changes are really, really large. So remember, these J2s are not actually zero before they're coming to fourth order imperturbation uh, theory. And so this result was for circularly polarized light. Here, uh, this black dot is for the equilibrium result uh, of comparing the ratios of J2 over J1 and J3 over J1. And we're doing this calculation for different types of unpolarized light. Uh, and these arrows are sort of denoting as I crank up A0 from zero to about two. Uh, and so I can change my second neighbor coupling uh, compared to my first neighbor coupling by a factor of about 16, uh, which is a huge, huge change. Uh, and similarly for the third neighbor coupling, you can change it by a factor of about four or five. Um, and in principle, I can explore different types of phase space using different types of unpolarized light. All right. so. Practically speaking, what does this mean? Well, it's not a very big change, but if I am lucky and end up with a real material that is very close to this uh, phase transition to a spin liquid, but not quite there, I can, in principle, push it over the edge. So if I apply unpolarized light, I can principally nudge it enough. So like this is about 40% of what you need to get from here to here. Um, so I can principally nudge it into this uh, Z2 spin liquid. Uh, and then I can also, with circularly polarized light, nudge it up into this chiral spin liquid. So in principle, both are accessible, and by tuning the polarization uh, from circularly polarized to unpolarized, I can tune from the Z2 or Dirac spin liquid to the chiral spin liquid, which is something we have never uh, actually been able to access. Um, okay, so then... Uh, yeah, okay. So well, last thing I want to talk about sort of for this uh, is talking about the time scales and energies and magnitudes of things. So some of you guys are actually working with real uh, lasers. Uh, and so these things are meaningful. So here is the picture again of this is time. This is my pulse. And here's what I want to do, right? I have my pulse. So in this region, I can do this bouquet engineering. I can expect my Hamiltonian to actually be periodic. So let me expand out this pulse and think about the different time scales I have involved. So T is the period of the laser. That's very fast. This uh, I'm choosing to be around two thirds of U. And so this is going to be somewhere around an EV scale. Um, just a side note, T actually has to be very small to avoid heating. Uh, so you have to have very strong mod insulators for this to work. Okay, so this is my periodicity of the pulse is around one over U. That's extremely fast, around a femtosecond. And then my polarization time scale, where my polarization vector is rotating around the plane, has to be about 10 or 12, 15 times that. So that's one more order of magnitude. And then I need my spins to actually react to the fact that their Hamiltonian has changed, right? So I don't. First, there's two things I worry about. One is my polarization time is changing too slowly so that instead of uh, feeling the average exchange couplings, they're actually feeling a time-dependent exchange coupling and just following along with that. Um, but my relaxation time for my spins goes like one over J, and that's a much smaller time scale than the one over U time scale of this. Uh, so this is about 100 times uh, this time scale. And so as long as this relaxation time scale for the spins is much larger than my polarization time, then I'm going to actually feel these averaged uh, exchange couplings. But the relaxation time can't be too long because it still all has to fit within this pulse. Um, and then I have to, after my spins have equil equilibrated, I have to actually do measurements to find out anything, right? So I can do optical measurements, uh, angle or all photo emission, maybe uh, anything that I can do ultra fast, magneto optical, uh, care effects. So 
this is sort of the, the theoretical picture. Um, the other thing you worry about instead of time scales uh, is how strong does your electromagnetic field need to be? And the answer is pretty strong. Um, and people can achieve these kinds of fields in the lab nowadays, but typically with much uh, shorter pulse time. So this is putting the intensity for the uh, A zeros we need into some units that may or may not uh, mean anything to you. But practically speaking, you can achieve these, but they're generally for pulses that are much shorter than the sort of hundred femtosecond pulses that you would need to actually do this bouquet engineering in a real material. But experimentalists are de developing power, more and more powerful uh, lasers all the time. So I have no doubt that eventually this will be possible. Um, all right. So uh, as expected, I really don't have time to get to uh, the next part of my talk, which is the condo physics stuff. Uh, but I think that's probably all right. Um, so maybe before I go to my conclusions, I'd all stop and ask if there's any questions about this kind of stuff. Okay, and I'll just see here. And let's see. Almost there. All right, so this is uh, really the interesting sort of feature that we found is that Floquet engineering can significantly tune the interactions that we have in correlated materials. And we can actually do Floquet engineering with unpolarized light, which is something that was not a given. Um, but we can do it so we can actually do this tuning without symmetry breaking. And this gives us an additional tuning parameter. So you can tune your frequency of the laser, you can tune the strength of your electromagnetic field, and you can tune the polarization either to break symmetries or restore symmetries selectively or to use different types of unpolarized light to traverse sort of slightly different regimes in phase space. Um, and so uh, you, get, you can generate new interactions like chiral fields for magnets. Uh, in the condo effect, I showed you could easily generate multi-channel uh, condo uh, points, different... Uh, symmetry channels for your condo screening. Uh, and you can essentially tune through spin liquids or quantum critical points um, and potentially do all sorts of fun stuff. So uh, with that, I am done. So thank you very much. Yes.